All right. Hi, I'm Dan Kastner. I'm the scientific director of uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon to the uh, Jeffrey M. Trent uh, lecture. Uh, Jeff Trent, as uh, many of you know, uh, was the first scientific director of the NHGRI. And uh, he was, of course, the founding uh, scientific director starting in 1993. And really, uh, Jeff, over the course of uh, a nine-year span, uh, built uh, the intramural research program of, of the NHGRI into, I think, a real powerhouse of uh, human genetics and genomics. Uh, Jeff, of course, went on uh, after uh, his uh, very successful scientific directorship uh, to be the uh, founder of TGen, uh, the uh, Translational Genomics uh, Research Foundation in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. Uh, Jeff couldn't be with us uh, here today, but is uh, still very actively involved uh, in his chosen field of cancer genetics. And uh, in 2003, uh, the Jeffrey M. Trent Lecture in Cancer Research uh, was initiated by the intramural program of the NHGRI uh, in order to uh, invite uh, leading figures in the world of cancer genetics who would embody uh, some of the same ideals of, of uh, energy and enthusiasm and, and imagination and uh, 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 really raw intelligence uh, to the world of, of cancer genetics. And so it's my enormous pleasure to introduce this year's Jeffrey M. Trent uh, lecturer, and that is uh, Dr. Stephen Chanick, uh, who is the director of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics of the National Cancer Institute. And Steve is truly uh, someone who falls into that mold of the Jeffrey M. Trent uh, lectureship. Steve is someone who's been, for a number of years, a leading figure in the study of susceptibility loci uh, for human cancers, uh, who has been a leader of the, uh, uh, the efforts of the Cancer Institute, and is also, I would say, uh, a Renaissance man and a real mensch uh, as well. So Dr. Chanick uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree actually at uh, Princeton uh, University in 1978, and his A.B. was actually in music. And I understand that he may be uh, breaking into song at some point uh, in the course of his, his uh, presentation. In any case, he went on to Harvard Medical School uh, and got his doctorate in medicine uh, in 1983, and then went on to uh, do his uh, further clinical training in Boston uh, in pediatrics and in pediatric infectious diseases and in pediatric hematology oncology. And he did research at Boston Children's Hospital and the Dana-Farber uh, Institute with the legendary and still active uh, Stuart Orkin, uh, studying uh, uh, molecular biology and human genetics uh, really at its uh, uh, inception of the modern era. So Dr. Chanick then came to the NIH in 1991 as a uh, medical staff fellow or senior staff fellow, I guess it was, uh, in the pediatric oncology branch. He went on to become tenure track and in 2001 uh, received uh, tenure. And over the course of uh, the subsequent years, he's uh, advanced in terms of his career uh, in the National Cancer Institute and in 2013, August of 2013, he was named to his current position as the uh, director of the DCEG. Really, he has, as I mentioned, done enormously in terms of his science and in, in terms of his administrative things, but I think something that really stands out in my mind is something that's a real measure of the man, and that is that since 1995, uh, he has been the medical director of Camp Fantastic, which is a camp uh, for children uh, with uh, various uh, pediatric cancers uh, that's held every summer uh, for a week. And it's uh, run by the National Cancer Institute and Special Love Incorporated. And so anyway, I think that that's just a, a, a telling sign of uh, just the complete man, uh, Dr. Steve Chanick. So Steve, take it away. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, I want to assure you I will not break into song, I do not play the guitar, and uh, I will leave it at that. Um, it is really an honor to be recipient of uh, this lectureship and named in, in honor of uh, Jeff Trent, someone I know very well, who is a very dynamic and lively character who worked with on and off over the years. And uh, energy and passion are two words that certainly come to mind when thinking about Jeff and his vision for where and how cancer research should go forward have always been in, infused with those two, uh, I think, very important qualities, along with the scientific rigor. And I think, you know, he, you know I'm sorry that he's not here, but I, uh, you know, I've corresponded with him quite a bit by email in the last few days, and he was very happy to know that someone who was interested in the germline and primarily primarily the germline would be speaking, because that's a part of Jeff's uh, portfolio. And today I will speak almost exclusively about the germline, but I think it's in the context of understanding how the germline informs our understanding of the, of the different kinds of cancer that we uh, encounter. So let me start with the question of heritability uh, in cancer. We know that going back to 1866, that Paul de Broca, the famous uh, neurobiologist, had observed heritability based in his own family with breast cancer, with a number of women in his family, sisters, aunts, mothers, and the like, and had actually published and described this uh, familial clustering. And then in the interim, there were you know, legions of, st of, st of studies of twins, families, and sibling studies that began to really assess what would be the risk if if you had one particular cancer in a family that another family member would have that. And that's an, a, still an important uh, bulk work, I think, of how and in what way we prosecute the question of the genetic basis of, of cancer. Uh, in 1969, Joe Framani with Fred Lee observed the familial clustering of multiple cancers in families, not just one cancer, but a number of them. And it was subsequently identified that of the mutations in the TP53 gene are responsible for a high fraction of the Lee Fraumeni patients. And they were ascertained through these familial studies, and I'm going to come back to this question of looking at Lee Fraumeni like uh, mutations in the population, particularly in osteosarcoma. And then Al Knudsen postulated the two hit hypothesis for retinoblastoma, really a central uh, tenet, I think, of how and what way we look at germline genetics, thinking of the diploid as the model, but as we as I'll talk a little bit later, the genome does come apart, and we certainly know that there are many different ways in which copy number states can vary. And then finally, the chase using the technologies of the 90s, the 80s and 90s, led to the first positional cloning of the familial breast cancer gene uh, in 91, and then subsequently by 94, it was described as BRCA1. Um, this is in the background of, of looking at heritability uh, from an epidemiologic point of view, where twin registries were really quite valuable, or have been quite valuable. And so this is an important table that I will come back to when I show you the current status of how we're looking at the genome-wide association studies to be able to explain a fraction of what we think would be the heritability. But the key issue here is looking at the heritable factors for prostate, colon, bladder, breast, and lung, you know, five of the major cancers that we face. And this issue of shared versus non-shared is, is an important question, which really underlines, we, th we think, the importance of the germline genetic susceptibility in, con you know, in the context of the different kinds of exposures, and I'll come back to that. So at this point, I would say, why do we study germline susceptibility? Well, we can try and explain the heritability of cancer. We certainly know about it clustering in families in distinct populations. But now, with the genome project behind us and the annotation of HapMap and, and knowing what genetic variation looks like in the common, we now have the tools to begin to really ask the question in sporadic cancers, which represent probably 90, 92, 93 percent, depending on your definition, uh, how can we explain genetic predisposition? We know that within families there are increased risks for breast and colon. Uh, you know, for one and a half to two-fold increase just in the general population. But I think the ability to look at genetic susceptibility is really crucial to begin to try and pull apart the many, many things that are contributing to genetic susceptibility. And then, of course, the, uh, the value of this in using it for risk assessment for individuals, which I would say we are very far away from being able to do 
other than the familial, and I think we have to be very careful not to oversell precision prevention, precision medicine at this time with respect to predicting individuals' specific risks for cancer. That's a, that's a place where we all want to go, but we have a lot of distance to traverse. But I think the population-based screening issue becomes very important in how we use the information that we have now and that we're about to have in front of us to begin to think about stratification that may have real public health implications for using screening trials, screening tools, and the like. And I think genetic uh, variation is helpful for that. We get tremendous insights into the etiology of cancer, the opportunity to look at gene and environment interactions, and particularly, as I mentioned at the beginning, how the germline informs somatic alterations. And then, of course, everyone is excited about pharmacogenomics, but this is a very difficult thing to pursue, and it's, uh, you know, we're sort of at odds with most of the industry because it's not in their best interest for us to identify the 30% of the women who should get Herceptin and exclude the 70% from being prescribed that drug. So this is something that sort of at a cultural level as well as a scientific level is, is really lagging behind. There are some very exciting examples, but I'm not going to really focus my talk on that today. I do want to start my talk and, and really separate the spaces. When we think about cancer genetics, we really have at least four different spaces as, as demarcated here. One is the germline, which is where I'm going to spend most of my time talking, but we also have the somatic. Those are the alterations, the actual tumors that we see in the NCIS-like sequencing from TCGA where we see all of the large-scale events that have taken place. We know that we're, we're heavily in the range of discovery, but with very little clinical action at this time. And I think we have to be very careful in not overselling what we can do with particularly the germline information, other than in very select circumstances. I think we all want to get to the next stage, but we still have quite a ways to go. So when we think about the germline, this is sort of the outline of what, we're gonna, what I'm going to talk about today, we know of at least 110 to maybe 115 cancer syndromes where we know that there is a very important mutation in the germline that explains the familial clustering of cancers in a family or sets of families. And these are very important in giving us very good insights into cancer biology and cancer drivers, and I'll come back to that. Through the genome-wide association studies, which I'll talk about, we know that there's some 470 regions and there are literally thousands more to be discovered as we supersize, and I try and make the argument for why we should continue doing that. Uh, we know that the somatic, when you look at the TCGA and the ICGC, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, the NHGRI and NCI uh, joint effort has been a, a resounding success in beginning to give a portrait of the landscape of genetic alterations. And we see that there are these drivers, those things that we think are very important, and we use both frequency and biologic investigation in the laboratory. But we also recognize that there is heterogeneity and the metastases that are uh, real challenges. Now, if we go to the clinically actionable, of all of the things that we see on the upper left-hand corner, only a small fraction can we really go into the clinic and advise or talk to someone in what we think is a really, uh, you know, a, a really a sustainable and uh, supportable uh, position. In the same way, only a small number of agents have really come to market. It's, probably, it's larger than this. This is an example of the targeted therapy and where I think the precision medicine initiative that, that uh, Dr. Varmus uh, certainly has been talking about is a very important one in being able to target the alterations in the tumors that we would be able to actually intercede and either stop or slow down the growth of those particular cancers. And we do this in the context of looking at TCGA, where we've had extraordinary lessons that have come from looking up and lining up all the different mutations and seeing the spectrum that we can see literally a, a four order of magnitude difference in the number of mutations and then the types of mutations, how many are real drivers versus how many are passengers. And this is something that's an important uh, element that's come out of the somatic sequencing that I'll come back to in the germline in a minute. So for instance, if we look at lung adeno CA, lung adenocarcinoma, one of the most common cancers, heavily driven by, by smoking, the attributable risk is somewhere, depending on who you're talking to, 75 to 85 percent for this particular cancer. And we can explain a fair number of the cases that we see having these mutations in genes that are quite disruptive, that we understand something about the biology or we see the frequency thereof uh, tells us that this is an important event. And we have a number of agents uh, this is, that are very important that could be used and that are going into clinical trials right now that are very exciting for lung adeno CA, but this is probably further ahead than just about any of the other cancers.
when we then look hard and ask the question next of how and in what way does this really line up with what we understand with the genetic architecture, I, I want to I take a step back and we're going to first talk about this space here, the rare alleles that are causing Mendelian diseases or familial clusterings of cancers, the BRCAs, the TP53s, the patch and the like. And currently at this time we know of about 115 and they're scattered all across the genome. And the interesting thing is that they're almost all ascertained in families. They're rare mutations with very strong effects from an evolutionary point of view. It's very hard to sustain them in a population. There's, there's a lot of very interesting population genetics. There's a whole other lecture on the BRCA, founder mutations that we certainly see. And then we certainly can see oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So they're, that those are important with respect to the kind of sort of classical genetic models of whether you're looking at an autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. But we certainly can see these in uh, these 115 genes or so that have been identified. And if we look here at a classic BRCA1 pedigree, we know that in most cases, having a BRC mutation is not necessarily 100% likelihood that that woman is going to develop breast or ovarian cancer. It's depending on the specific mutation, and this is a very important point about where in the gene the mutation takes place. And then there are 24,990 other other genes, not to mention the environmental exposure. So, uh, you know, there are large consortia that are identifying what are the important clinical modifiers as well as biologic modifiers of BRCA1 and 2. And I think that this is a very exciting thing that's going forward and we're just beginning to identify maybe the first 10 or 12 regions of the genome that are interacting with BRCA1 that may be very important in identifying in contributing to the risk for breast cancer. But the question is then, what type of breast cancer? Because we know that there's heterogeneity, there are different types of breast cancers that do track with the BRCA1 and 2, but not perfectly. Again, this notion of genetic determinism we have to get past. It's a more complex scenario, and I think the further we get into this, the more we recognize recognize the, these factors that we, that we really need to be able to identify and put together these critical sort of compendiums or catalogs to be able to then look in larger studies. So if we look at these 100, whoop, excuse me, 110 genes, pardon me, interestingly enough, about a year ago, Naz Raman uh, in the UK published a very nice paper in Nature in which, which she looked at at that time this question of what fraction of those genes were identified as in the germline as explaining a familial cancer that had already been identified in a somatic setting, not necessarily in the gene or not necessarily in that cancer that was being identified in that family, but nonetheless was considered to be an important driver. And interestingly enough, about 50 percent at that time, and now if you revisited this, it's probably up to about 65 percent of the familial cancers of these 115 have you know, the mutations are lying in a place that we know somatically is very important in one or more cancers. So these have high frequencies and these somatic mutations, again, are the important drivers. But I want to keep separate the idea of what's driving the cancer once it starts as opposed to where the germline is, uh, you know, a susceptibility factor. And this is where we have to invoke Knudsen's two-hit hypothesis in the retinoblastoma model that you can start with a germline and then add a somatic or a somatic event happens on top of that in certain key genes and then there's a very high risk for cancer. So when we looked at the, you know, this particular list, we, we certainly in DCG have had a long-standing interest in TP53 and the leaf Mani syndrome and the characterization thereof. And we had done a large genome-wide association study of osteosarcomas and found a few regions that looked to be very important for risk for osteosarcoma. But one of our uh, junior faculty, Lisa Mirabello, had a terrific idea to take those same samples and sequence P53 with next generation sequencing, not Illumina, but ion torrent. There are other technologies that do work and can be published for the, for the young that are out there. It's important to recognize that, hard as it is to get past that. But the, the, the the issue was to look at our distribution of osteosarcoma, and I show this because the punchline is going to basically show that there's a divide in terms of where we think the genetic uh, susceptibility with respect to P53 is, is, is factoring. So we also know that there's some other things such as the RECQL4, the Rothman Thompson syndrome, and hereditary retinoblastoma. We know that um, osteosarcoma can arise in other settings. So it's very interesting that 
Uh, we went and, and sequenced all of the P53 exons, the UTR and tronic flanking regions, and then we classified on the basis of already the international classification of the Lee Fraumeni syndrome mutations that are already in the IARC database, and then ones that are likely to be those on the basis of uh, predictive uh, deleterious mutations, and then rare exonic variants where, which had very low mass in the public database. So when we looked at this data, what was interesting to see was roughly 10% of the children and young adults who had osteosarcoma, none of whom had been ascertained through family studies, and we had no evidence of family history in these 765, were harboring one or more, or, or not more, but one of these P53 mutations. And so what, when we looked at a different way here, as you can see, the P53 mutations by, you know, by age overall, as opposed to looking at 0 to 10, 10 to 19, 20 to 30, we could, we could see that there was a break by the time of age 30. So in other words, you know, when we look at P53 and those mutations in osteosarcoma, if, if they're going to happen, they're going to happen earlier in life. And this is an important issue that's very difficult with the studies that we have in hand now to really start to layer on age in terms of when is the risk really an important risk and when does it go away that you can say someone is pretty much out of the woods. So we, we thought that our findings were very important and they're getting published in JNCI in the next week or two and kudos to Lisa for really pushing through on this, that the young onset osteosarcoma has a distinct germline genetic etiology compared to the adults, which we know. And then here's the question, considering genetic counseling and P53 mutation testing, should this be introduced into the children's oncology group? So there's an active discussion now, and we've shown this data in Europe, and the Europeans are looking at this as well, asking the question, in the pediatric oncology clinic where you're seeing you know, uh, children with osteosarcoma and young adults, should you be considering uh, you know, a more um, a formal type of genetic counseling? We're moving that way. but. Uh, you know, this is discovery, this is very new. One is not saying that this means that every osteosarcoma patient tomorrow should get screened for P53. I mean, we have to think hard about how we're going to study and validate this, but we, we find that these are the kinds of exciting things that we're getting in this discovery series and how and in what way we move to the next level is clearly very important because the other question is what other germline mutations lurk in the you know, in the young onset osteosarcomas, and we have to ask the question, should we be sequencing more than P53? And the answer is, of course, yes. You know, and so we are moving down that road towards exome sequencing now and potentially a whole genome sequencing. So I think, you know, it's Im important to recognize that there is a whole spectrum of how we're doing these analyses. So if we come back to this figure here and we see that there are these very rare, highly penetrant, strong mutations that we see, and then as we bleed down into these lower frequency with some moderate effects, these are the hard ones to be able to identify. And then of recent, the genome-wide association era has really focused on common variants that have been implicated in GWAS. And so I do want to talk about these because these are very important in building a polygenic model. I've seen that there are many, many small effects that are contributing to the risk of both common and uncommon cancers. So as we go forward, and we see really what is a genome-wide association study for those who have not conducted those. These, this is not for the weakest stomach. It's not dissimilar from a vaccine study where you start, you go a long period of time, and then there is a p-value or a set of p-values that you're either really happy with or you're really depressed. Uh, so it's not for the weak of heart going forward and doing these large-scale studies. But I think the, the key issue here is starting with case control studies and whether you're in cohorts as we've learned very good case controls and sometimes not so good case controls. We can use the large agglomeration of cases to be able, with, um, with adequate controls, to be able to identify the big top signals, but we don't really have the full panoply of all of the polygenic signals that are part of that. But as we go forward, we know that we go from the cases and their DNA to scanning them to doing the QC steps and the agnostic analysis, and this is really what's different about genome-wide association studies. You look and the data tells you where there's an interesting area. You don't say, gee, I always thought that P53 was interesting in osteosarcoma, so I'm going to therefore look at that. That's a very dangerous thing to do. And then we have our Manhattan plots and our replication, and these are stages that take a number of years, but they're, they are now part of the fabric of genetic susceptibility studies. And as you can see here, as of December, the field now has about 475 that have been published in some 29 cancers, only one of them with a copy num number variation. 
And interestingly enough, only about 8% of them are shared, which raises this question of how much is the bias of how the studies have been conducted versus what is the shared heritability. And I'll come back to this concept of shared heritability as we look at the large set of GWAS that we have and try and compare them in some very sophisticated analyses. Um, and the other thing is what's very interesting is of these 475 or so, not, almost none are associated with outcomes. So it's telling us, I think, an important question that there are certain genetic regions that are very important for risk for developing the cancer, but whether you go on and develop an aggressive form of prostate cancer or whether you survive breast cancer or ovarian cancer, they're not the same regions. It tells us the complexity of these things going on over an extended period of time is really driven by a number of factors. And again, we are just beginning to pull apart what they are. So if we take prostate cancer, as we can look here and see there's some hundred different regions. It's just like shotgun across the genome. The, they're scattered, but very few differentiate between aggressive and non-aggressive. A number have been published, and most of them die on the altar of attempted replication. There may be two or three that are able to actually survive, I think, stringent statistical significance, which is very important because whatever our findings are, there are wonderful postdocs and pre-docs who will work on each of those regions, and you don't want to send people off to work on false positives. And so uh, there is value in the, in the genome-wide significance. So for prostate, we really don't see a, a whole lot of measure of, of things really coming together, whereas in testicular cancer, which has the highest familial risk, what's really interesting here is just about all of the hits, and they come at a much faster rate relative to the number of cases scanned. Um, we're 21 with another, I think, 11 getting ready to be published uh, from uh, conglomerating the studies, and you can see all of them localized to genes that are important in telomerase regulation, germ cell development, and sex differentiation which has really been quite striking. It's the, one, it's the one cancer with the highest heritability, as we know that in the twin studies, uh, monozygotic you know, twins from the same are 75-fold increase, the dizygotics are 25 to 30, brothers are eight-fold, so there's clearly a very strong, it's a very rare cancer, so it does raise this question of the, the issues of absolute risk, and we'll come back to that. And I think, you know, it's also the one genome-wide association hit that's of a high enough effect size from the kit ligand, which is an interesting gene under selection having to do with hair color at this moment, um, but there have been some very elegant papers in Cell on this, that it's strong enough for a genetic counselor to actually think about wanting to give someone advice on the basis of being a homozygote. Now, again, thinking about it, I don't think at this point it's ready to go into the clinic. And, uh, you know, most genetic counselors would not jump on this and say this is something that we're going to do today. But again, this is where the discovery engine is now pushing and the, and the structure is how and in what way are we going to be able to address those questions. When we look a bit further, so for instance, one region becomes six. Here around the telomerase gene, there are now 10 different cancers. And the interesting thing, what Aloifi and, and Zhao Ming had really identified, is that in each one of these regions, we saw a kind of pleiotropy where all six of the independent regions have some that are protective and some that are susceptible. So in other words, the exact same allele in one disease can be a protection and the, and the other can be susceptible, which really underscores the importance of looking at other genes and more importantly, I think, the environment. And the place where this is most confusing is if you look at skin cancer, basal cell and melanoma are in the opposite directions, pancreatic and lung as well. So it, it, you know, this is a very interesting region that we know that there are highly penetrant mutations that are very important as well there. So when we assess these GWAS regions, you know, there is this tension between wanting to look at all of them for risk purposes versus wanting to look at individual ones and go and do the fine mapping. And we do both, and where we know one region becomes five, often they're hidden in there, and this is helping to explain a little bit more of their heritability. Some regions harbor alleles for many different cancers. And then we have to start asking the question, what about accounting for exposures like smoking and lung cancer, smoking and bladder cancer? And I'll come back to the bladder cancer in a minute. And then the question of the value of these large sets of SNPs as we put together these catalogs, the idea is at what point will they be of sufficient use to be able to think about in terms of public health? At this point, it's really very clear that they're not ready for individuals, even though 23andMe, Decode Me, and a number of groups have tried to sell these over a period of time. It's, you know, uh, genetic snake oil. Well, I'll say enough said on that. Uh, <laughs> So 
when we look at the GWAS cancer susceptibility hits themselves, and we look at these 475, we see a very different kind of biology underlying these particular regions. So there are 470 distinct regions, only about 25 of which have been explained. 20% are in regions where there's no gene that's anywhere near connected to any of the correlated variants. So in other words, it's doing something for some funny RNA or something that's important in, in genomic regulation. When we've looked at this, less than 5% of the genes that fall under the peaks of these genome-wide association studies map to the cosmic database, unlike what I showed you with the highly penetrant mutations where 50% was reported and it looks like it's moving closer to 65%. Nearly all the GWAS hits that we're looking at are looking at things that are really, um, that, are, that are perturbations, they're changing pathways, but they're not necessarily altering a particular gene. There are very few that are coding when we really explain them. So Mitch McKeel in the lab spent quite a bit of time looking at the first blush of about 265 going and really very carefully looking at all the genes and looking at cosmic, and we could see that there was really no difference in the kinds of mutations, the number and the types of mutations between those genes that run to the peaks for GWAS and those that would be randomly permuted based on genomic location, GC content, the kinds of things that we think of in terms of the, lo the locale that may be important in contributing to risk for random or real mutations. So now we, we come back to this architecture of genetic susceptibility of cancer, and we can see that we really have perturbations of key pathways in the common variants, and each one is making a small dent that's neither sufficient nor um, required for developing the cancer, unlike what we see in the familial settings where we really do have those damaging drivers. So as we look at this map and see that, well, with linkage studies and family studies, uh, you know, historically we're filling in this part of the space in any given cancer, and with GWAS we're going here. But in between these low frequency variants that are part of this oligogenetic, mo oligogenic model are very tough to get at. And this is where next generation sequencing and laboratory investigation really have to hit the road. So what I would now subscribe is that each major cancer has a unique underlying genetic architecture and we are at different points in being able to build up the catalog of understanding what contributes to breast versus what contributes to prostate. There may be a few shared things, but nonetheless, they really are, in our minds, very important to build these models because as we build these catalogs, there may be increasing clinical utility as well as uh, the obvious value of being able to use these catalogs, particularly in common cancers, where if you're able to stratify and ask the question of the changes in absolute risk, for a common cancer, that may have real public health implications. For a very rare cancer, a shift in the absolute risk is a harder sell at this point. And so I think if we had, you know, with limited money, I would, I would submit if we are going to really make an effort to have a complete catalog of what we think genetic variation looks like, one could make the argument that some of the common cancers are the places where we should put our money. And in fact, we are doing that with the GAMON and the Anka rays and the like. We're doing that with breast and prostate and, oh, and, and lung and colon and ovarian. So if we look at the genetic predisposition to breast cancer, you know, in 1994 I mentioned about the cloning of BRCA1 and, and then shortly thereafter two. We can now look and see this kind of sweep of having a number of genes that are highly penetrant, but they're very rare. And then the GWAS era has put a number there, but we have very little in this space here that we are now going after with exome sequencing, where we have to try and put together very, very clever stories. Similarly, we can see the doubling of the number of hits tells us that we can explain about 35 to 40 percent of the familial risk. And familial risk is defined here, we think, in, in these common cancers as between one and a half to two-fold increase. So if there's someone with a prostate cancer diagnosis or a breast cancer diagnosis in a family, there's an increased risk that someone else in that family has that. And this is a statistic to try and explain how and in what way can the SNPs, the space of common variants, explain a fraction of that familial risk? Because therein lies an opportunity to be able to then have stratification based on what we would see as a, a useful shift in, the, in that. So prostate is looking very different here, as you can see. There's virtually nothing in the high risk uh, and the, you know, for the SNPs, it's been very, very exciting. So for quite some time with Nalanjan Chatterjee, uh, 
colleague in, in DCG and, and others have been looking at this question of what are the limits of using SNPs? Because at one point there was a lot of excitement, people were jumping all over and suggesting like in Crohn's disease where we have very high sibling relative risk that you could use SNPs to be able to move the AUC, the area under the curve, to be able to get close enough to a place where we would think that it would be clinically implemented. Now if we look at the common cancers of breast, prostate, and, and colon, when we were looking, uh, Nalangin and, and, and Park had made some very, very important estimates based on empiric information, as well as now being, you know, borne out by the larger consortium, that there are probably, there are clearly limits to looking at the sibling risk model of about two for breast and prostate. And in fact, he just yesterday was very kind uh, to be able to provide a very important new slide here of looking at we, can, we know we can explain 35 to 40 percent of the familial risk of breast cancer, which again, the issue is in the absolute risk for screening, and the question is how we do that is still very much on the table. But as you can see, these curves as we go from what's empirically to what would potentially be known from going ahead and looking at as many as 500,000 cases and 500,000 controls, which is something that the world is moving towards. Right now, there's a big study of roughly 150,000 breast cancers and 150,000 controls, and that will continue on, and that allows us to really identify what we think are at least on the order of estimated to be 3,000 or more different SNPs. Now, each of these may have their own story, but it's going to be decades before we understand what those stories are. But the question is using this information in terms of risk assessment is a different question, and I think, you know, we, we will be most effective in having as comprehensive a set as possible. Because even if we just look at prostate cancer risks, here from Antonis, <coughs> UK, excuse me, if you look at the 76 SNPs that have been identified, if you start looking at the risk factors, and, I mean, and you look at the risk for developing disease, age is very important. And again, as we do these studies, we've been, we've been really two-dimensional in our genome-wide association studies and many of our familial studies and not really being able to assess the value of age and particularly of secondary factors, whether they're environmental and or particularly uh, other genetic effects. So excuse me just a second. So with that, I think is an important uh, story to just delve into for a minute with respect to <coughs> looking at smoking. So out of the genome-wide association studies of bladder, interestingly enough, a gene that had been identified by the Canada gene world of one of the four or five that had survived the 10,000 attempted publications that hadn't really survived replication is the NAT2 slow acetylation gene. And interestingly enough, you only see the effect in individuals who are smokers. So this really led us, particularly with Nalangin and, and Nat and Monsi Garcia closest, to look very closely at this question of the cumulative 30-year absolute risk in some of the cohorts that are available to us to ask the question of what would be the risk for a 50-year-old male in the U.S. by looking at smoking and 12 SNPs, including the, the Nat and, and the Nat 2. <coughs> and as you can see, the, the RD here does separate quite nicely between the low risk and the high risk. This is not to say that we should start screening every potential smoker for, for bladder cancer. There are many other comorbid conditions and the like. But let's just do the thought experiment that if we had 100,000 smokers with high genetic risk who stopped smoking, we had effective cessation. If we were thinking about bladder cancer, where we have enough known about the genetic susceptibility, we would eliminate 5,400 cases. This is just focused on only bladder cancer. If we then look at 100,000 smokers with low genetic risk and they stopped, we would eliminate 1,500 cases. So it raises this question of how and where we would apply these kinds of risk reduction strategies. So it's a possible example, really, of how genetic and environmental risk stratification may translate into targeted prevention, the so-called precision prevention. But we are a long way from doing that. I think the next sets of studies need to really assess and confirm this. And the question is, what are all the cofactors and the comorbidities of lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, and the like? So it's really an important question. But I think, you know, it's that sort of exciting, um, you know, uh, opportunity that really tells us that we need to look very, very closely and why we need to have, I think, these very large compendiums.
excuse me one second. So really, what fraction of the polygenic component contributes to each cancer? So we've done scanning of over 100,000 individuals in 15 different cancers. And so Josh Sampson in our program, one of the young, terrific biostatisticians, looked at 13 cancers, used the genotype SNPs to explain anywhere from 10 to 50 percent of the variability on the liability scale. So going back to this kind of study that I showed at the beginning for the twins, you can see at this point for GWAS, we can explain <coughs> some fraction, and depending on the cancers, it can be anywhere from 15 to 50 percent of what we can see in terms of the familial risk with the large number of SNPs that are available at this time. So the shared heritability, when you start looking at these and lining them up, there are some very interesting things that have started to come out where you can see very strong correlations where there's overlap between cancers that you would you would expect like testes and kidneys and CLL and large cell B cell lymphoma. But interestingly enough, DLBCL, a type of lymphoma, and osteosarcoma, share a heritability that was not anticipated. So again, this discovery element of giving us new clues and ways of thinking about diseases is very important. Not different from how the TCGA analysis in looking at certain mutation signatures have told us things about bladder cancer and potential viral pathogens and some of the you know, gastric cancer and EBV. These are the kinds of things that looking across these large sweeps give us new places to go. <coughs> so lastly, really, what, when we talk about GWAS, what's in a GWAS region? We know that it can inform our understanding of the somatic changes, particularly in that region. We have many correlated SNPs that have to be mapped and choose the best variants for laboratory evaluation. So of those 475, only about 25 are explained right now. And a small fraction of them may allow us to really look at environmental or other genetic alterations. So we have a wonderful resource that, uh, again, NHGRI was really the driving force of this. And it, it really has, I think, transformed how and in what way to prosecute these. And this gives us the opportunity to be able to map and go after each region. So let me just give you an example here where there's a potential clinical implication, I think, that Mila Proconina Olson had identified with one of the bladder signals on chromosome 8 in the PSCA gene, where she mapped it, figured out the very best SNP statistically and, and uh, analytically in the laboratory, could see that the functional SNP changed the expression of this particular gene. And it just so happened there's a, a humanized antibody to this particular gene being tested in other cancers. And so we've been trying, unsuccessfully, but still pushing hard to ask the question, is this the disease where this particular humanized antibody should be tested? And here is a potential translational application of identifying a particular biologic story that comes out of looking at a particular GWAS region. This is not to promise that all GWAS regions will look like that, but I think there is very interesting biology in terms of the regulation and the changes in, in very important pathways and particular genes that are critical for cancer. <coughs> so we come back to the architecture of genetic susceptibility of cancer in this sort of middle space here of the low frequencies that um, that have intermediate effects. And actually, Jeff Trent was central to one of the examples I'm going to show in a minute, that Kevin Brown, who we hired from Jeff as an intramural investigator, was able to do this. And it's very important that the laboratory activity is there because it really does help us get past the signal-to-noise ratio. For those that have looked at exome sequencing and seen 5,000, 2,000, 10,000 interesting-looking variants, it's very hard to know which ones are the right ones. And to do the agnostic search for rare variants is very difficult, as Eric Lander and others have suggested that we're going to need 20, 30,000 cases just to begin to identify and get the right signals to come out of this. And, and you know, this gets at some very profound questions. So, so Kevin looked at the MITF gene on the E318K mutation that had not perfectly segregated in families with melanoma, nor was it that strong an effect in the population, but it was clearly there. But the interesting thing is when they went into the laboratory, as did a group in France in parallel, <coughs> they published, excuse me, in, in Nature, this very interesting study where they, there was a lot of biology, the simulation of that particular uh, moiety on the MITF gene, sort of giving the scientific laboratory corroboration that this is an important risk factor. Similarly, we, we've gone ahead, and so uh, Terry Landy and Cheng Chen Shi in our program looking at POT1, an important gene in telomerase uh, stability, identified very similarly 
families and populations where the effects weren't were not segregating like our classical Mendelian families and they weren't quite strong enough as we saw in the genome-wide association studies, but they had signals in both that when we went to the laboratory, we were able to identify very important laboratory experiments that really sealed the deal, so to speak. And I'm, I'm afraid that this space is going to be one that's going to be very difficult it's going to be much slower to get to where we're going to have to use laboratory evaluation as well as the, um, the statistical op you know, operations to be able to get there. So we know that there are many difficult regions to get at and we won't necessarily get to all of them in the low region here individually, but the polygenic models of SNPs will allow us to do that. And then we have occasionally these very rare things. So I think at this point the report card on cancer genomics in 2015 is that it's really just the start. We really have a, a ways to go, and it's, in a, it, it's been a very exciting discovery period, but it should not end. The, the battle is clearly not over. We know that discovery is in progress, and we're defining very different structures for the underlying genetic architecture. We know that the current profiles are better suited for risk stratification, a form of precision prevention, but we haven't figured out how to develop those studies yet to confirm those. And then the discovery of new biologic insights into cancer are clearly very important. But the next real front here, I think, is to get to the environment and molecular heterogeneity. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge, I'm going to go on for about five more minutes, Dan, because I, I want to talk about how the genome is falling apart, but I wanted to identify and particularly call out the remarkable uh, colleagues that uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, particularly Joe Fraumani and Bob Hoover and Peggy Tucker, and certainly a number of other individuals within DCG. And, you know, the slides would go on like a Hollywood movie for three minutes of music if I were to show the 400 collaborators and all of their associations. But this is really the value of team science uh, in, a, in a really very special way. So let me just say a word or two about genome screening. You know, is it promising? Is it haunting? Or is it dangerous? It's probably some of each at this point. And, uh, you know, as we go forward with next generation sequencing of tumors, it means we're sequencing normal tissues. And it's a very hard issue you know, ethically to how, how not to look at that information. And when we start looking at that, that information, we ask very important questions of what's going on with our genome. Are we going to have to sequence our genome more than once? And I would say we, we may be faced with having to make those decisions. because. I would say aging is tough. It really is. We fall apart. We get arthritis, obesity, heart disease, cognitive changes. We have decreased oxygen consumption, immunosenescence, fewer neurons, telomere attrition, genetic mosaicism. And so one of the things that we've noticed that as we were doing six years of GWAS, we had looked at over 100,000 samples in 45 different population studies. We kept seeing these sort of funky uh, QC failures. But we saw enough of them that a couple of the astute people in the laboratory said, hmm, there may be something there. So what we unexpectedly found was large chromosomal abnormalities. So about one and a half to two percent of the population over age 50 is walking around with a subpopulation of cells in their blood or their buccal uh, component that are these very ugly looking uh, mosaic events. And I think this is something that sort of triggered this whole world of asking the question of the dynamic genome. And we know that we can see this in, in many different uh, populations. Uh, and we've extended this now to over 125,000 individuals. And we know that the phenotypic expression of mosaicism has certainly been around. Classical genetics told us about eye disease, you know, calico cats, uh, neurofibromatosis and the like. And we know in the extreme, it's an age-old explanation for a subset of neurofibromatosis and trisomy 21s and Turners. We know that. Um, that it's also very important for rare, highly penetrant mutations that lead to variegated aneuploidy that tell us a lot about uh, stability of chromosomes, but the BUB1B families and the CEP57 families, as rare as they are. And we also know that, uh, you know, that the complex syndromes where we see, and, and some of the leading investigators in NHGRI have identified some of these very perplexing situations where what we would say in the cancer world, an AKT1 mutation in lung cancer or neuroblastoma, you see in the germline that's expressed only in a, in a particular tissue, you know, giving rise to Proteus syndrome or Olier's disease. It's really, it's really quite striking. Um, so we clearly know about this, but when we start looking at the large, here is the chromosome, uh, you know, you know, the homunculus chromosome of 1 to 22 of the autosomes. And if we look at 
127,000 individuals, this is a paper that Mitch has led that will be published very shortly, we can see that there are different kinds of events that are gains or copy neutral or losses in very large scale. And we know that this is really the tip of the iceberg. And we know, unfortunately, that this increases with aging. So if we look at all of our cohorts from age 50 to 75, these events increase in size. And the question is, are they harbingers of neurodegenerative, diabetes, cancer, and the like? And this is really a very difficult question. We don't, we don't have evidence at this point that there are strong risk factors for developing cancer, per se. There's some papers in looking at complications of cardiovascular diabetes disease. But again, this is still the, the start of it. If we look at by chromosomes, we can see that the X chromosome is hit very hard, and interestingly enough, and the Y has the most number of mosaicism. And so for men, 15 to 20 percent of the men at age 60 are missing a good part of their Y chromosomes, which is very interesting. I'll show you data on that. But here, it's why, you know, the, the X chromosome is very interesting, and then there are these regions on chromosome 13 and 20 that are very important in the hematologic cancers that you see normal individuals walking around with those. So the hypermutation of the inactive X is a very active field in the somatic world, so it's telling us something about the replication with the inactive X being the last chromosome to be uh, replicated, that there's more error that takes place in the ICGC and the TCGA data. And so we're asking this question, could this be restricted to the inactive X? And we're not sure, but we're moving forward on that right now. There have been a couple papers looking at Y loss as a causal or consequence of aging and smoking. Uh, the the uh, Swedish group has suggested that it's important for susceptibility to cancer and have actually started a company. You know, I mean, you may as well flush your money down the toilet, the best we can tell, because the data is not very strong. And when we look in our large cohorts, we see absolutely no effect for susceptibility. But we do see age. And here you can see by the time people are in their 60s to late 70s, 20 percent of the men have lost almost all or all of their Y chromosome and their mosaic uh, thereof. And so it's really important. Similarly, the survival analysis has been suggested, but we don't see any effect whatsoever when we look in our large cohorts that we followed for a number of years. And, and it's probably, you know, the probability of event decreases. Interestingly enough, if you stop smoking, you have less risk for having that Y chromosome uh, mosaicism. So in our minds, this is sort of the tip of the iceberg looking at these large scale events. And, and a number of other groups have started to look at this with sequencing looking at favorite hematologic genes. There are age-related mutations that are associated with clonal hematopoietic expansion and malignancies. Uh, looking at the TCGA data, age-related clonal hematopoiesis, again, of looking at individual sequenced base changes, seeing two populations of cells. So uh, to take a step back, the hematologic cancers are very different in our mind. And we've looked very closely in our scanning, in our, in our cohorts, and are able to see, as well as did the Geneva, that the, there's an increase in the number of these kinds of events that are seen particularly in individuals who go on and later develop a cancer. So in other words, is this a potential biomarker? Could this be exploited to screen people who would be at high risk? But we don't know what all those risk factors are, but we certainly can look and see you know, untreated leukemias uh, particularly have an increased risk of having one of these events of 13 or 20 per se. So when we looked at the CLL GWAS that we did, and we particularly looked at individuals who had blood anywhere from two to 10 years or more before their diagnosis in these prospective cohorts, we could identify a series of mutations that were seen in mosaic states in these individuals as long as 14 years before their actual frank diagnosis of CLL. We don't have the full uh, you know, uh, we don't have, you know, the full karyotyping of all of the events, but we can see these are all events that are reported in CLL. The reds are those that are of poor prognosis. So it, it does raise this question of being able to see well, you know, as much as 10, 12 years in advance of a diagnosis of CLL that somebody could have one or more clones that are identified at a, a high enough fraction that could be detected by our current technologies, which is about 5% of the circulating cells. We can, that's our discriminatory difference. So our implications for aging really, uh, in our minds, are very important in thinking about this sort of global concept of genomic instability has been described by others. And it gives us clues to what can be tolerated or potentially selected in cancer. And as we go forward in thinking about precision 
uh, prevention, I think this notion of mosaicism is going to be particularly important in monitoring individuals up to a certain point. Is, are those changes specific to the cancer or are they part of a global system that's sort of falling apart? And this is a very important hypothesis that I think large population studies really need to look at. And we certainly know the role of this in non-cancer diseases that track particularly with ages. And there have been some reports recently and I think that we'll see more and more as they come along. So let me just end by uh, by saying, you know, to be able to do this work, it's really a pleasure to work with so many people. And to quote a, a great Princetonian president who happened to then move to the White House, Woodrow Wilson, you know, that to paraphrase, we, we use not only all the brains we have, but all that we can borrow. And in doing that, for instance, with the mosaicism, we have these huge consortiums with hundreds of individuals. And again, these are the kinds of things that really are critical to be able to make these large population-based observations that drive us back to the laboratory and make us think hard about the next public health questions and where we want to implement these particular observations. So with that, I will stop and thank you again and I very much appreciate the honor of giving the Trent Lecture. Thank you. Well, Stephen, thank you very, very much for that spectacular lecture. And uh, limited as we are in terms of the kinds of gifts that we can bear, at least publicly, uh, I have the small token of our appreciation from the National Human Genome Research Institute uh, that commemorates uh, this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. All right. And I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. And of course, there is uh, a wonderful uh, spread of food uh, out in the library awaiting us after the last question is asked. So anyway. Just two brief questions. As a pathologist, I've seen problems with prostate and breast. In particular, prostate is a natural occurrence in older males. Right. And in all through the spectrum, when you find a low Gleason grade prostate uh, carcinoma or what appears to be one, you don't know if it really is something that's just going to be there for the guy's life or what's going to go on. So I, I pr suggest to you that the definition of what is a prostate carcinoma is uh, important in terms of biological uh, well, behavior. And the second thing is in terms of breast you get what's called an atypical ductal hyperplasia, and nobody knows what it is. Is it, is it going to become cancer or isn't it? I understand your, your markers, but if a pathologist is going to start calling them when they get to a certain point of atypia, this is a cancer, it's not going to be helpful in terms of you defining cancer risk. So I think definitions by pathologists in terms of those two cancers in, in specifically are needed before you can move forward in defining cancer risk. You have to define which biologically or which, what is your definition of a cancer for prostate and what is your definition for breast cancer versus atypical ductal hyperplasia. Well, thank you. Your, your point is very well taken and I would uh, like to assure you that there is a tremendous amount of effort focused on this. So in a number of the scans that have been done both in breast and prostate, the question, you know, the issue of limiting them to individuals who have particular stages of, you know, Gleason 7 and above. Uh, and, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of effort has gone into trying to standardize in a lot of these international studies. Uh, this has been one of the challenges of what's very interesting about prostate cancer is when you look at the regions that you find from scanning or analyzing 7 or, or even 8 and above, and then you bring back in the the five, the rare fives and the six, you see basically the same regions are lighting up. And this has been a big disappointment. This has been a hard thing. The idea of the, are there genetic determinants or genetic uh, factors that contribute to the risk for having very aggressive types of prostate cancer. We've been very hard pressed to find them. We have, a, we have one or two that are, we're just putting in press and another group has one or two that have withstood the test of time of being replicated over a number of studies that spend a lot of time going through this issue of pathologic review and pathologic sort of transmissibility from one study to the next. 
For breast cancer, the Breast Cancer Consortium have been very careful in trying to separate out the early lesions from what would, you know, in, in, in situ from what would be considered to be frank carcinoma. And a number of the studies are now moving on using molecular characterization of saying, you know, luminal A, luminal B, triple negatives, HER2, and, the, and those kinds of molecular, uh, molecularly defined types to be able to more to, to better refine the analyses and to be sure that we're looking at comparable things because a disease like breast cancer may be as many as nine or ten different types of, of breast cancers. And so I think as we accumulate these very large studies, we do have opportunities to look at the subtype specific effects and how they are. But I think, you know, the, 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 this epidemiologic world works very closely with, you know, scores or hundreds of pathologists worldwide to address these questions. And just one brief comment, your aging hypothesis has been given credibility by another a pathologist here who gave a lecture last week saying that the BCL2 is known to be elevated with age. Right. BCL2 being the, uh, what is it, B-cell lymphoma gene that's known to cause immortality in cells and anti-apoptotic. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. So what is it about the Y chromosome? And, uh, why is it disappearing faster? Uh, good. Uh, my wife's here, you can ask her. But <laughs> uh, it, 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 well, the, the Y chromosome is, there, there, there are two aspects that are very interesting about it. One is, if you actually look at the topography of the Y, there's a lot, you know, there's the pseudo-autosomal and shared with X chromosome. So the amount of real estate that we consider to be unique is a much smaller amount that we're looking at. Uh, and you know, there are relatively fewer genes that are involved in things other than sex determination and fertility that are on the Y chromosome. So, you know, there's a lot of hand waving, but I don't think anyone has a very concrete explanation of, you know, GC content or something about the actual structure of where those breaks would take place. Uh, you know, it, 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 is a, it is a remarkable phenomenon that that's tenfold more common in men than, it, than you see in women. Remember I showed you that the women have higher rates of these larger events, but again, that's still down in the weeds compared to where the men, men so, are. So what happens to the function of the people who are almost, I guess, losing most of it, most of the Y chromosome? Well, many of them are, you know, go on and maybe president of the United States or do whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a high enough fraction. If, you, if we look at the PLCO, for instance, you know, a, a cohort where there are a lot of very high performing individuals, we, we haven't done the mapping against their professional and, or, and their personal outcomes, and I, don't, and I, I wouldn't want to care to do that. But it, but it is, you know, a, an interesting evolutionary question. At what point does the Y chromosome become uh, less important in, in biologically, and I think, you know, the mosaicism certainly does does press that question. Thank you. Good luck in exploration. All right. Well, I think we probably ought to call it to a close, and please do join us uh, for the reception over in the NIH library, sponsored by our friends at the FAES. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This was really it was spectacular. Thank you.